Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar tonight, Getting Started with 3D Printing. My name is Mark Barry, and I'm the Managing Director of ESM Digital Solutions. So the subheading for tonight's webinar is Explore the Next Steps of Your Digital Journey. I'm sure everybody who's uh, attending tonight is at some point in their digital journey. If we could ask for a raise of hands, if I could see you all, I'm sure we get about 90% of people are already using infraoral scanners. If we went back five years, I'm sure, and we asked the same question, I'm sure only a very small proportion of people will be using intraoral scanners. So everybody's on their journey, on their digital journey, um, and inevitably the next step for those who are scanning already, the next step is going to involve 3D printing. So in the Managing Director of ESM Digital Solutions, uh, we set up the business in 2007, initially offering a scanning service to orthodontists for digital study models. And with time and evolution in technology, our business grew and, and evolved to suit the growing needs of, of the market. Um, my background is I'm a mechanical engineer with lots of experience in CAD CAM, precision measurement, all that kind of good stuff. So tonight, objectives and overview. So first of all, we'll look at the applications and benefits of 3D printing. We look at specifications and features of 3D printers. We look at the key differences between the different systems. I'll be doing a, a demonstration, so I've recorded some material. So we'll we'll play that and, and walk through that, talk through that, discuss what's happening there, and then take a look to the future of 3D printing. So firstly, let's take a look at some of the applications of 3D printing. We pretty much are at a point where anything that can be made or any uh, any dental indication can be made through 3D printing. We're at a point where we can print metal. We can print metal frameworks, metal copings, partial frameworks, all that kind of good stuff can be printed. Are we gonna print that type of stuff in-house? I'd say absolutely not. Are we gonna print everything that's shown here in-house? I'd say most likely not. Surgical guides, yes. Models, yes. Digital dentures, are we going to print dentures in-house? Perhaps not. Uh, clear aligners, I've got a slide on that, a little bit of conversation to have on that. But provisional wax-ups, is a provisional crowns and, and, and diagnostic wax-ups, very much so. Indirect bonding tray for those who are interested in orthodontics. Splints and night guards, easy peasy, definitely something that we, we, we can do really well in-house. And we are now at a point where we can print um, definitive crowns and bridges and indeed um, we've got some people who are out there printing full art implant supported bridges. So applications, what do we need for a perfect result? We need an accurate scan. Really most scanners are, are, are going to be able to produce a, an accurate scan for 80 to 90 percent of the indications or, or the applications that they'll need to um, to scan for. Um, design, we're gonna have a little conversation around the design element of it. Um, printing is great. Printing is to some degree easy. Um, scanning, obviously it's a chair side process. It's that bit in the middle, it's the design that we, we need to always consider, never underestimate it. Um, of course, the printer, the hardware itself, the materials that you put into it, the post-processing solution. So when the material, when the object comes off the printer, before it can be finally used. Um, we, we call that step the post-processing stage. So we need to make sure we have the right equipment for that. And of course, support, whether that support's coming from a Facebook forum or it's coming from a manufacturer directly or a reseller company like ourselves that have training programs and can provide the level of support that you need to kind of get, get onto that learning curve really quickly. There are all the, the kind of the key ingredients. So let's take a look at some of the benefits. So. Chair side printing is a real thing. Printing in a practice is a real thing. I would be quite confident that anybody, everybody who's uh, attending tonight will have at least one colleague who is printing to some degree. We'll, we're gonna talk about the geek scale. I like the geek scale. The geek scale is from, uh, from, from this, let's say from this end, who is a super geek and you want you just wanna roll your sleeves up and spend time after practice and and and, and deal with all the problems and, and have fun and explore and experiment. And then at the other end of the scale, it's a case of, well, I just want to pick up a piece of technology that works. So we like to identify kind of where, where everybody is on that, on that scale. Um, no matter where you are, chair side printing is there. We can now ch ch print chair side in a really good time frame for, for lots of different indications. Um, the patient experience, what's great about 
bringing printing in into a practice is now we can use our scan for everything. Uh, we do a scan, we can make a model, make a retainer on it, um, as opposed to doing a scan for a record and then still taking a conventional impression to make a um, to make a model, to make a retainer on it. The practice efficiency, again, just to, to uh, talk about retainers again, patient loses a retainer, they make a phone call, I've lost my retainer. You say, great, let's print a model, let's make a new retainer, obviously considering you know, the risk around um, relapse and so on. But you know, there's huge efficiencies there if ortho is a big thing for you. Costs, by all means, yes, there is a, an initial investment around printer, but obviously the more work you can bring in-house, to some degree, there will be a reduction in your lab costs. Practice marketing, patients love technology. It's not unusual for us to see people, uh, clinicians putting the, the, the printer in a, ver in, in a visible area, perhaps in a reception area, behind some glass, behind a glass partition. Um, so patients can see it. Patients now recognize a printer. And it, of course, it's a, 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 a talk, creates a talking point at that, at that stage. Staff job, job satisfaction. We do find a lot of practices will embrace this type of technology because I'm going to use the word fun. It's fun for some people um, on the geek scale. No matter where you are on the geek scale, um, uh, printing is fun. And a lot of staff do like to get involved in it. And what we often hear from a lot of dentists as well, whether it's for intraoral scanning or for 3D printing, is that you know it, it brings another level of, of interest to the job. So um, I'm cheekily using the phrase there, make dentistry fun again. Um, so in terms of your own job satisfaction. Let's have a quick look at different 3D printing technologies. If we were to define what 3D printing is, it's a group of technologies used to generate a three-dimensional object from three-dimensional information, typically an STL file. I'm sure you're becoming more familiar with that type of uh, terminology. Um, it's often, the 3D printing is often called additive manufacturing. You start off with nothing and you gradually build up the objects that you're, you're looking for, as opposed to subtractive manufacturing, which uh, milling is a typical uh, subtractive manufacturing process where we start with a block of material and then we have a milling burr and it will remove material and we end up with the objects that we want. Um, so examples of 3D printing are FDM, fused deposition modeling, SLA and DLP. So FDM is by far, I suppose it's one of the, the most accessible 3D printing solutions. It's great, It's a little, a, you've got a wire, you've got a plastic thread fed through a nozzle, it's heated up, and effectively the, the shape is woven out of um, out of that near melting point plastic. Um, not really practical for dental applications, models perhaps, but beyond that, um, beyond that, not really. Resin type, resin based printing is where things are at for, um, for dental applications. We have a much wider range of materials. It's where the focus is for all the technologies. It gives us much higher resolution, much higher level of detail. So the basic concept is, is that we have, let's just turn on my laser pointer here. So we've got what we call, referred to as the build platform, and we've got a resin tank. So the resin tank is, the resin is, it's effectively like a light curing composite type material. So you can see that we've got this plastic plate being produced here. So as the build platform moves in, and then we see an ultraviolet laser line. So it's an ultraviolet light source, and in this case, it's a laser, and it just draws out the pattern and it selectively cures the layer of material. So what happens is it's incremental. So initially that build platform comes right down to about, let's say 0.1 millimeter from the bottom of the tank. The laser draws out the pattern, cures the resin, and that first layer sticks to the build platform. Build platform moves up a little bit, fresh resin underneath, the, the laser does its work again and, and, and cures another layer. And then that process repeats. So it's very much a layer by layer by layer process. The thicker the layer, the chunkier the, or the, 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 chunkier the resolution, or let's say the, the more steppy the part will, will look. And we'll talk about um, that type of thing shortly. But what we see here, this is one of the original form labs machines. And it's, it's just, it's a nice GIF, it's a nice graphic or illustration of what's happening. But what we got is this little black wiper and it wipes the resin. Number one, number one, it's mixing the resin. And number two, it's making sure that there is resin, liquid resin present at that area where we want it to, um, where we want the curing to happen. 
So in terms of resin printing technologies, there are really three main categories. So resin printing is a liquid resin is cured using an ultraviolet light and how that ultraviolet light creates the image that's needed um, can vary. And typically it's these three main um, systems. So the one in the middle is SLA, the original, very, very original stereolithography concept. We got a laser source, it hits a mirror, the mirror bounce moves and bounces that laser beam in a particular pattern. So you can see there for that particular shape, that the, uh, you can imagine that mirror has to move in, in lots of different directions and orientations very, very precisely to, in order to, to draw out the pattern. That can take a bit of time. DLP is a more popular process. Um, it's all, all of the process, it's probably the most expensive because the laser projector is more expensive to, to produce. Um, lots, lots of great technology inside it. Um, however, its lifespan is, is quite long, so it's a quite a durable um, type of process. But what we got is projector, it hits a mirror and the image bounces out. And so the whole image for that whole layer is projected in one go. With SLA, the, the image has to be effectively drawn out with this tiny laser. The third scenario is LCD. It's a lot cheaper. It's a lot cheaper, but there is a, a defined lifespan to the um, to the projector and to the to the mask, um, and typically it's a year, two years, depending on the, the manufacturer and depending on on the amount of use that you get that that it gets. However, the technology works on this basis. You've got an LCD, you've got an LED projector, which isn't really illustrated here, but it's the LED is generating the ultraviolet light, and that ultraviolet light is on all the time for this whole area. But the LCD panel, liquid crystal diodes, are um, a liquid crystal display, sorry. like So like a, a typical calculator, a calculator display, that gray surface that's areas are turned on in black to create the, the numbers and the, and the shapes, it's that kind of thing. So what happens with the LCD panel is it's it's it selectively opens it selectively becomes opaque it selectively allows light to pass through um and that's so that and that light is ultraviolet light generated by the led panel and therefore we're creating this layer um the the, the pattern for each particular layer so irrespective of which each uh, irrespective of whichever one of these um solutions is being applied an image is being created and the resin is going to be cured in a layer by layer type manner. So if we look at just kind of the uh, kind of a little deeper look at the technologies and, and how they impact the level of resolution and the level of detail. Um, if we take SLA, we've got a laser and this is typical of the Formlabs um, solution. So we've got a laser beam. OK, in this case, it's 85 micron in diameter, 0.085 um, millimeters. The beauty of it is, is that if we want to create a circular pattern, that laser is going to follow a circular path. And so the out the this surface, the, the extremity, shall we say, is nice and smooth. With DLP and with LCD technologies, it's pixel based. And so we can't really create a perfect arc or a perfect circle with square pixels. And um, the smaller the pixel, the finer the detail, the finer the resolution that we're going to get. Um, however, it's you know, it, it's 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 part and parcel. What we the, the, the trade off is that DLP is considerably faster than SLA. So SLA, we're, we're getting arguably a, a greater level of detail, but at a slower at a slower speed. And that's the kind of the key difference between them. Whoops, how did that come up? So um, if we just do a quick comparison that SLA can give a smoother surface, as I say, in the X and Y direction, it still works in a layer by layer manner um, as it's been built up. So in the Z direction, there will still be that stepping effect. Again, very, very small for both technologies, for all technologies. The smallest detail will be limited by the, the laser diameter. Smallest detail for DLP will be limited by the projector pixel size. Um, the time to print depends on the area exposed for SLA. And imagine that. So you've got a larger area, you've got a laser point drawing out that particular pattern. It's going to take more time for it to do. It's still very, very fast, but it will be a lot longer than, than DLP. So it follows DLP. It's going to be faster. Um, because DLP 
is based on a, on a projection. What happens with a projected image? We get distortions around the extremities. Now, again, minor level, it's very much factored into the accuracy of the machine. So what you'll find is on this projected image, uh, the, the projector acts over, uh, over a certain area. When the, the manufacturer, I'm going to speak on behalf of Sprint Ray anyway, but I, I'm not sure, I'm sure other manufacturers work on a certain base, similar basis. When they talk about a pixel size, the pixels are going to be the biggest on the extremities, but that's what the machine's rated pixel size is. So anything closer to the center is actually going to be of a higher pixel size. So it's win-win. It's not, it's not a, a huge consideration. Um, and smaller pixel size means greater resolution, means more detail, again, in the X and Y direction. The layer thickness, i.e. how thick each layer is made up, is a Z resolution. Um, and that's not a parameter of the technology, SLA, DLP, or LCD. That's just a, a parameter of printing, resin-based printing, any printing, in fact. So let's look at some of the elements of a, of a 3D printing system. Uh, there's a machine, the machine you buy, or it's 600 pounds off Amazon or 60 grand, whatever you're, you're going to spend. I'm sure we're, we're kind of somewhere in between, maybe. Um, where there's always going to be software and software is often underestimated. We're going to spend a bit of time looking at it in a bit more detail um, because it's a, it, it's a key. It's the engine behind the printer. It's the software is we drop our file into the software. We do stuff within the software and then that gives the instructions to the machine as to what it should do. So features that we look for within software are the ability to repair files. So you bring a file in, maybe there's holes, maybe there's overlaps in the mesh. We want the software to look after that. To turn a scan, an intraoral scan, into a model is a really nice thing to be able to do. Some softwares offer that, some don't. Uh, every software is going to offer the ability to orientate and, and to apply supports. Labeling, in my mind, it's a, it's a very basic fundamental requirement for particularly for in practice um, printing. Um, and surprisingly, very few solutions actually offer that. Slicing verification. It'll make sense when I show you. Um, design and services. So going back to the point I made just a, a few moments ago is if we want to print something in-house, how are we going to design it? And we need to you know, pay, pay a bit of attention to that. So some, um, some printer manufacturers will offer design services, online design services via their portal. And that's great. There's obviously third party solutions out there. You can get software yourself. Um, and there are a couple of, printing software solutions that actually have a design capability within it. A really nice feature is fit adjustment. Um, and that's if you've got a situation, a print is produced, and maybe let's say it's a night garden, it, it's a little bit tighter than what you'd like it to be, that there's a fit adjustment within uh, some softwares that will allow you to make an adjustment, reprint, and then you get a, get a better fit um, or a more pre preferable fit rather than trying to redesign the splint again. So it's a nice feature to have once we understand how to use it and use it correctly. So a little video here on um, the uh, on, on nesting software. So this is the Formlab software. I'm just going to let it run, talk through it. The idea is you define, select a printer from your list of printers. If you have multiple printers, you define what you're going to do. So in this case, we selected that we're going to do a, print a model. We selected it's 100 microns in terms of layer thickness. It's really nice in terms of the Formlabs printer. Is Formlabs is it's a it's a fabulous printer. It's an engineering printer. It, I won't say it's an, specifically an engineering printer, but it's it's a generic printer. But they have a huge focus on dentistry, so they do have a dental workflow within their software. And what it means is they know that as a clinician, you've got an intraoral scanner. You just want to bring a scan in, but a scan is not printable directly. A scan is not printable because it's a shell. So the first thing we need to do is turn it into a, a full kind of let's say a, a, a 3D entity. So we could bring in multiple files at the same time if we want. So you can see there we've got an intraoral scan that's just being dropped in. The grid that we're, we can see that we saw there a moment ago, let's see again, that grid represents the build platform. So what I'm trying to do here is orientate the model. We could orientate it so the occlusal plane is kind of level to the build platform. Or in fact, what I'd like to do as well sometimes is look at the um, I don't have a, a word for it. I'm not sure if it's a clinical term, but I'm looking at the gingiva and I'm kind of, because we, we never want to cut the gingiva off if we're printing a model. So I'm kind of looking at where the, the high points on the gingiva are and I'm trying to line that up parallel to the, um, to the occlusal plane. 
and I can introduce a trim feature um, and a plain cut feature. So what the software is going to do now, it's just going to trim out, define an area of the, the model that we want to keep, an area we want to get rid of, and then it turns the model into a 3D printable entity. We could hit print at this point and we'd be good to go. Over the right hand side here, you can see we've got the little green thumbs, everything's everything's good. But I just want to play around with the software a little bit, just again, just to help understand how we can use the software. Um, so in this case, this little tip that was shown by one, one customer, um, sometimes they find that they struggle getting a print off the build platform and it can be stuck on quite um, heavily. So what they do is to make little chamfers at the heels of the model, nothing too, nothing too great, but they're using the tool within the software. So they orientate the, um, orientate the model at an angle and then use that trim cut tool again. And you can see the plane just down here. And once we make the cut, we'll see, boom, there we go. And we just cut these little chamfers. Then we reorientate the model so that it's sitting flat again. All that red area, just in case you're wondering, is it's the software is telling us that it's not happy to print the model as it is. That those red areas are, um, there's concerns that that will not print properly. But we've reorientated the model. It's sitting flat and you can see the little heels. So just little kind of cutaways to allow us to get a tool in to prise the models off if we need to. This is a really nice, this is so this is slice verification that I mentioned. What it's doing is it's allowing us to view through and, and slice through the model and see each layer as it's going to be um, produced. So we obviously we can see, um, see how it was originally. Now I've reorientated the model. You can see that initially, okay, we're, we're starting off with a very small surface area there. And then that blue area is the pattern that has to be drawn out by the laser on each particular line. So you can see we, we're only attaching to the build platform by a very small area. And the risk here is that as we build that model up, it becomes very heavy and it may become detached from the build platform. And the result of that is a failed print. And there's a bit of work to be done if we end up having a failed print. And number one, we won't be able to use it. We've got to clean the tank and uh, make sure everything is, is taken good care of. Supports are something that's used within 3D printing and every software is gonna have the facility or the ability to generate supports. Some will do it effectively and efficiently, others maybe maybe not so, but I'm just gonna throw some supports in here just to show us what the concept of supports is all about. So software generates the supports. So we see the whole area of that model is red. What it's software is saying, if we try to print it like that, nothing is supported, it's going to fail. The software has brought in these supports. Again, going through slice by slice. And you can see the model being built up. Now we have an edit tool within this software. So I'm going to now delete out some of those support points. I'm going to leave some overhanging surfaces. So the green points are, are where the supports are making contact. So straight away, I remove three. The software is highlighting that area as being an unsupported area. And the result is we're going to end up with some problems. So what kind of problems? How, how is that going to create a problem? Well, we'll see now. OK, so I'm going to run the slider through again. So our supports are generated run the slider through and let's let's bring it back down again. So we can see those areas that are highlighted in orange, they are unsupported areas. And what happens is at this point, okay, so these areas here are being printed, but they're not attached to anything. Okay, just there and there, okay? They're just, they're attached, they're print, being printed, but they're not, not attached to anything. They will stick to the bottom of the resin tank. The, part will, the rest of the part will be printed, but those areas will stick to the bottom of the resin tank. So not only are they not part of the model that they should be part of, but also they're going to block out the laser from doing any more curing in that particular area. And the result is we'll end up with um, a big defect on, on that model. We'll end up with a defect on the model and we'll end up with uncure, a cured resin in the, in the resin tank, which can be, um, can be a big problem. So it's something we want to be very uh, 
careful of. Right, so we're happy with it. Obviously, I've done lots of forward and back and change a few different things just for the purpose of the exercise. We hit print. Software says, great, what printer do you want to send the print to? We select that from our list and then hit go and, and off we go. We, we go off to the printer. I wanted to use this piece of software to show you this process because it's a really easy piece of software. It's very user friendly. It's packed full of functionality. Um, and it just gives us a good understanding of, well, hopefully it gives us a good understanding of, of what we need in a piece of software. So when you look at something that's clunky, you'll recognize that it's a clunky piece of software. So considering all those various factors, you just put a little matrix together just to talk about some of the printers that we're familiar with. Of course, there's lots of different printers out there, all having their own different softwares. But some of the key things there to highlight, the ease of use, form labs and sprint rate, hands down. Um, the ability to put bases onto the scans. Again, form labs are, are in there. Uh, so, and I'm saying auto basing, okay? We do have that ability within a shining printer. Um, put labels on, we can do it in shining, we can do it in sprint free. We cannot do it in form labs nor with the Asiga software. User control, Asiga, you know, scoring highly there. The reason I say that is Asiga is a fabulous printer, really accurate, very highly detailed, huge material range, but it's more of a lab product. It does take a little bit more effort to kind of get um, uh, familiar with the software. Sprintray has a cloud solution. They offer design services. Shining have the, some design tools within their software and Spr Sprintray have the fit adjustment feature that I mentioned there as well. So materials is a really important thing to consider. If you're looking at buying a printer, you got to ask yourself, um, what do you want to do with it? What kind of materials are, are you going to, want to work with it and there's historically within technology particularly for dentistry we talk about open systems and closed systems um there's some there's a there's a milling system a chair side milling solution uh traditionally referred to as a closed system and i as one as a digital evangelist um would often be critical of closed systems however what i think is really important to understand is that a closed system is not necessarily a bad thing. Does it restrict what you can do to some degree? But does it offer a very optimized workflow? Absolutely. Okay, and that's, so that's the kind of the, the trade-off. You get a very optimized workflow. So with Formlabs, a very optimized workflow. So you can buy a Formlabs material, put it into your Formlabs machine, use your Formlabs software, your Formlabs resin tank, hit go, and you know it's going to work and you're going to get good, consistent results every time. It's like baking a cake, okay? We need this, the right ingredients, the machinery, the oven, the manpower, the person doing the baking, the ingredients, the materials, and the methods, our recipe, okay? We need all those um, that we used to call it four M's in, in, in engineering, the me methods, materials, manpower, and machinery, okay? So that's all very, very consistent. Um, and it means you'll get the same result out every time because it's optimized, right? Um, and that, that's the, the language that we like to use. So you could say it's closed, but yes, you can only use formalized materials in a formalized printer, but it's very optimized. Sprint rate. Um, have their own range of materials as well. And obviously, you know, there's a, an, an emphasis on using those materials in their printers. However, they have a validated workflow for a lot of third-party materials, meaning you can take third-party materials, selected third-party materials, put it into your sprint race system and be very, very confident that you're going to get the right solution out, the, uh, the right result out at the end of that process. A SEGA. A SEGA have their own range of material. And pretty much every 3D printing material that's out there, I'm gonna, you know, we'll, we'll, set, we'll go for 90, 95% of materials that are out there for dentistry work on an Asiga printer. So Asiga's kind of business strategy is let's make a great printer and let's be as open as possible and let people who make materials make their materials um, validated on our printer. What happens after the printing process? Well, that's other people's um, concerns. Um, so the result is there, we've got a huge range of materials that can be printed on a SEGA, but when it comes to washing and more so when it comes to curing, you know, you got to make sure you have the right curing solution in place. Whereas Formlabs and Sprintray will only allow you to use materials in their printers that can be washed and cured correctly within their process. We'll be talking about curing um, shortly. So third party material validation is critical. And what I mean by that 
is not all resins are the same. So if you're taking a resin, you want to put it onto a printer, you got to make sure that that printer resin has been validated for that machine, particularly in dentistry, we're making stuff like night guards, we're making stuff like dentures and crowns and stuff that's going to go in the patient's mouth. We need to make sure that, that it, the, the product that comes out at the end of the process, not out of the printer, at the end of the process after washing and curing, that it's uh, um, it's appropriate, it has been cured correctly, been printed correctly, so that we can be happy that when it goes in the patient's mouth, it's going to be safe. So let's talk, talk about some of the other elements of um, 3D printers. The build platform. Again, this will vary from printer to printer, but the size of the printer will dictate how much work we can produce in a particular, um, in, in, in a build. Um, again, just for simplicity and for consistency, I've just been talking about models, but it's a similar concept applies for, for anything that we might be printing. But if we print models sitting flat on the build platform, like here, here, and here, the layer thickness, the height, the overall height is small, so the build speed will be uh, will be lower. If we print models vertically like this, yes, we might fit more models in. However, the, the vertical height is, is larger, so therefore the print time will be longer. And of course, we've got this kind of craziness here as well. Um, and the majority of times it works, but the problem is when this type of stuff doesn't work, if you end up getting a failed print, not only do you have, not have your parts, but you've not got your material either. It can be quite quite a costly um, quite a costly loss. So always, I just wanted to include that. I suppose just for, just for the fun, we wouldn't really encourage people to print in that kind of crazy manner. The other element of a printer is the resin tank, and this is a critical element as part of the printing process. Uh, printing is an optical process. You got a light source, whether it's a laser projector or or LCD and LED kind of mix with with, with um on some printers, uh, but you got a light source, and that light source needs to get through to that resin without any obstruction um, and, and, and in a reliable manner. So we've got resin tanks. To some degree, resin tanks are considered a consumable. You will use them, they will have a lifespan and you will throw them out. Some, they, a, a resin tank typically has, will always has a, a opaque, opaque or semi-opaque base. And that base can be um, a, a plastic. Um, it can be a combination of plastics. It could be a, and I'm going to say a glass and a plastic with sprint ray. I'm not sure if it's actually glass, but it's a, a, a solid um, clear material with a more flexible clear material attached to it. Um, and some, some printers have, it's just that the, the tank is a frame onto which is attached a replaceable, um, it's called FEP. I'm not sure what FEP uh, means, but it's it's kind of, a, it's one of the very early um, names that were picked up. Uh, it's a It's a film. It's a film of plastic, um, a lot more durable, a lot more uh, scientific than cling film. But for all intents and purposes, let's keep it simple. It's kind of like cling film. So it's certainly something to consider the cost of them, the lifespan of them. Do they have a replaceable FEP or not? And their durability, puncture resistance. Why is puncture resistance uh, important? Well, you're going to have a resin tank. You're going to have resin in it. If it gets punctured or damaged and it leaks out resin, that's a very messy mess to have to deal with um, and clean up and perhaps it may cause damage to the machine as well. So it's something to be con uh, to consider at least. Mixer capability. Um, the Formlab system has a mixer, a little wiper. You saw it in the, uh, the, the animation or the GIF that I presented a few moments ago. Um, and it's a wiper. It's there for mixing, but it serves some other purposes. If there is debris in the tank, the mixer gets dislocated and triggers an alarm, say something's not right here, we're not going to run a print. Uh, when the print head, the build platform, I mean, comes down, the wiper moves across it and detects if there's anything on it, again, preventing a print from happening if there's models um, or objects that still stuck to the build platform. So it's actually more, more like a kind of a safety check as well. So it's a really nice feature there. Um, RFID tracking. So what you really want is if, you're, if your resin tank has a defined lifespan, you want to know what that lifespan is without having to keep a log book or some other way of tracking it. So um, some printers now have the ability that when there's an RF, RFID tag on the tank, you put the tank into the machine, machine recognizes the tank, it knows its age, how long it's been used for, how many cycles it's been used for, and can give us a, an idea as to its health and give us a, a, an indication as to when we should replace it. 
So as I said, the, the resin tank is critical to print reliability. So never underestimate it, never push it um, beyond its its use. Washing. So uh, par printed, printed parts, parts are printed. The resin is, um, it needs to be cleaned. Okay, the parts are printed, comes off the printer, they're covered in liquid resin, we need to clean it. And generally speaking, we use IPA, IPA for isopropyl alcohol. That's what we use for cleaning the parts. So it's a few different solutions. Some manufacturers have their own solution. Traditionally, it was just a kind of a bucket that was, you know, the parts were put in and, ma and manually manually agitated. Sometimes we use a uh, an ultrasonic bath. Uh, Sprint Ray have a, an automated washing unit. Lots of different um, solutions out there. It's important that the parts are washed, um, washed and uh, appropriately and clean. All of that uncured resin needs to be removed. Um, after the washing cycle, so we've got printing, we've got washing, and then we've got a curing cycle. And curing is about finalizing the part. Not only do we get do we get the right surface properties, the mechanical properties, the strength, the wear resistance, and so on, but again, particularly for dentistry, we're looking at the biocompatibility. We wanna make sure that that resin that's in a bottle, that's a liquid, that's highly toxic, when it's turned into something that it's supposed to be turned into, it's done properly and it's a good result and that it's it's safe to put into the patient's mouth. So curing and curing correctly are really, really important. So the factors in, in, impacting curing is the light wavelength and, oh, apologies, typo there, light wavelength and intensity, the time of curing, how long the, um, the, the, the material is exposed to that ultraviolet light for, and the temperature of the curing chamber as well. So again, you've got some lots, lots of different options here. Um, and then we've got some, let's take take curing to, I'm gonna to say to another level, but it's, yes, it is, we are taking these curing units to another level. I suppose the, the idea here is we're removing oxygen. Um, and the idea is that we're going to do the curing in an inert environment. And how do we create that inert environment? Now, one solution is typical of the auto flash is where a nitrogen source, i.e. a cylinder of nitrogen in your in your lab or in your practice is used to create this inert environment uh, within which the curing happens. Um, uh, Graphy is a Korean company. They brought out this Terra Hearts curing unit. And that's very smart. It's connected to compressed air. And what happens is they have a nitrogen generator within it and what happens there is that the uh, nitrogen generator extracts nitrogen dumps off everything else from the uh, environmental air um, and takes that nitrogen generates its own nitrogen and dumps it into the curing chamber while the curing process happens very smart solution we've then got rapid shape they really need solutions as well and they're vacuum curing so they suck all that air and oxygen out of the chamber whilst the curing happens um, and there is a, I'm going to say workaround, I want to be very careful about that. Um, sometimes it's a validated workflow and the manufacturer says it's okay to do this. If they don't say it's okay, then it's a hack, then it's a workaround. But some manufacturers say it is okay to create an inert environment by curing in glycerin. So if you put the object into glycerin, uh, a little glass jar of glycerin, put it into a regular curing unit, you are creating an inert environment there. The glycerin kind of effectively just eliminates any oxygen from being on the surface of the, the part. Post-curing, always follow the manufacturer's IFUs, the instructions for use. Never ever deviate from it. The best place, if you've got a question about how to cure, you contact the manufacturer, not your buddies on Facebook. It's incredible the amount of people who will say, I've got this resin, I'm going to want to try it in this machine. It's not validated, but how do I do it? How do I hack this workflow? Uh, any tips on how I can cure it? I even saw a guy, you got a little plastic box, put a connector in, a connector in, and, and decided that that was his inert, his, his um, nitrogen chamber. He's going to hook a nitrogen supply up to it. And it's just worryingly crazy, exciting and interesting, but not if it's something that's going to go into the patient's mouth. So always, always, always follow the manufacturer's instructions for use. Otherwise, you're playing with fire. OK, so just again, I cannot emphasize it enough. Um, a lot of science, a lot of research, a lot of time and money and effort and love and validation and government stuff has gone into 
defining these workflows, defining these processes to make sure that the thing that comes out the end, i.e. this tooth or night guard or denture or something that's going in the patient's mouth is safe for the patient. Please avoid deviating from it. So a uh, question we're often asked is what's the difference between, let's say, a 600 quid printer and a 12 grand printer? OK, just purely uh, coincidental of the two different systems that I, I, I put on the machine there, on, the, on the slide there. But are you looking at just a printer or what we might say a printing solution? A printer is something that will turn liquid into a solid. Is it going to be appropriate for the application? Um, the accuracy, the speed, the resolution, um, the repeatability, actually, that's something that I, was sh I, I should have put in there, the repeatability, the reliability of this, of the solution. Um, again, if you're, if you're interested in seeing how, ex what kind of experiences people have with printers, go online, go on Facebook, there's lots of Facebook groups out there. And um, when it comes to the cheaper printers, it's very much, uh, everybody's out there using it and using it really well and for the most part they're doing it in a safe manner but they're doing so after hours or at lunchtime or at the weekend um there's a lot of work in getting those printers to to produce and produce reliably a heated platform and tank this is an interesting one and highly underestimated um resins like to be printed at a particular temperature if temperature's too low the resin li the liquid itself will be too it'd be too viscous okay so it won't flow as well as it should so build platform comes in liquid flows build platform moves out liquid's supposed to flow but if it's too viscous it won't flow as much as it should and we may not get um material flowing back in the way it should uh sprint rate have heated build platform and a heated tank um, and that, that just ensures consistency um spoke to one manufacturer recently they were talking about a particular during the winter They've got a lot of support calls about a particular material because the material doesn't like being used in a cold ambient temperature. During the summer, they get support calls about a different material. And the reason is because that material doesn't like being used at higher temperatures. So having this kind of heat temperature control within your system is really, really important. The build quality, of course, the build quality, you're going to get a, lot, a, a much better built machine and, and system for 12 grand than you are for, for 600 quid. So you can be more confident that it will produce accurate results um, repeatedly. Connectivity. Uh, some of these cheap printers, they don't have Wi-Fi connection. So you're, you're literally taking a USB stick, plugging it in and, and uploading your files. Um, bit of a first world issue, but what if you're tr looking at bringing 3D printing in house, unless you've got somebody that's there going to manage these systems all the time, you really want it to be absolutely as simple and as, as bulletproof uh, or bombproof as possible. Uh, some systems, again, the, just on the, on the cheaper end, require le regular calibration and leveling because of the build quality. They're just going to they're going to throw themselves out of um, out, out of calibration. Software functionality, something to consider. Validated workflows. You buy a printer like this, this type of printer, your cheap printer. It's just a printer, it's not a curing unit, it's not a, no washing unit. You know, you're 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 out there trying to figure out. The bits yourself you buy a solution everything has been figured out for you and that's really what you're what you're paying for um software firmware and materials update so the materials update is just what something that people maybe under underestimate um materials evolve techniques evolve so if a let's take it that is a, a crown material and the manufacturer has as um has identified actually if we print each layer for an extra one second um we're reducing what we need to do on the curing side the final curing or whatever my case might be but you know, what means is what it means is that if that manufacturer then releases those material updates through a system that has the capacity to handle those material updates you as a user don't need to do anything about it you're always kind of operating to the best solution the best uh, workflow um, and then again difference between the the different systems is are you getting dedicated support from a manufacturer and a reseller or are you on facebook late at night hoping that somebody on the other side of the world is up and awake and understands your need and can help you out with your problem so let's take a little look to the future where are we okay where are we going to be brilliant right so there's an, uh, clear aligners can we direct print clear aligners and the we're, we're getting there really we, we really are getting there for mass production type stuff i don't know 
the properties of clear aligner needs to be clear. It needs to be biocompatible. It needs to taste neutral. It needs to allow the printing of fine details in a very thin cross-sectional manner. We need to be able to wash that and re reclean that um, very reliably. So you've got deep, narrow uh, cavities within it for incisors. You need to make sure that any excess resin is cleaned out of that. Um, the biomechanical properties of a term of a of a retainer or an aligner are a property of the thermoforming process. So can we reproduce this with printed materials? And yes and no. Um, printed materials will allow us a bit more control because we might decide to make things thicker in one area and thinner on another area. To, so it'll give us more control. So it's exciting to see what's going to happen with that. Um, but um, yeah, it's a bit of work to be done, a bit more evidence to, to start coming coming through. So there's thickness control. We can do that through software. There's materials out there now by um, Luxcrea, Centertech, and Graphy. I suppose Graphy is probably the one that's out there on the, the larger scale. Um, the what I think the conclusion about it is, from what we see, is that the, the cleaning process, the process from printing all the way through to having something in your hand that you can be confident that is safe to go into the patient's mouth, it's quite it's not I'm not going to say laborious, but it's it's very process sensitive. So we want to be very careful of that. Um, and then we just look at the economics of the current process. The current process is print a model, very cheap, thermoform on top of it, very cheap. And here's my mic drop moment. If the big clear liner companies aren't print direct printing yet, it kind of indicates that you know it's not there yet. So what else can we expect in future developments? So printing technology, speed, resolution, accuracy, have we plateaued to some degree? Yeah, absolutely. The I suppose the development rate has, has, uh, has decelerated, definitely in terms of speed, resolution, and, and, and accuracy. Um, it has decelerated in recent times. Materials, yes, the materials are all improving, all improving all the time. So printed, direct printed uh, aligners is coming. Without a doubt, it's coming. I don't believe we're there yet. Um, dentures, yes, we're pretty much there right now. Crowns, absolutely. There's a lot of really good stuff. Unfortunately, it's in the States. Well, I'm saying unfortunately, but I suppose the, the good news is, is that the, the materials are developed, they're in the States, they're FDA approved, and we're just waiting for that CE approval to come to come through so that we can start using it on this side of the planet. Um, that's a little bit frustrating because we all want to start using them now but at the same time what it means is that you know there's all that experience being built up and with experience gives us confidence that the materials are durable that they do last they do work they are stain resistant and and we we know we'll, there's a lot of learning that can happen whilst we wait so when they when the materials do come through as ce approved you know we'll be a lot more confident that they're going to do what we expect them to do um, materials, faster printing times. Yes. Are we going to get, the, and, and because that's going to be down to the kind of the chemical makeup of the materials that will be more photosensitive. So they'll react to the, uh, um, relax to the, react to the ultraviolet light quicker um, and cure quicker. And then software. It's all, a lot of it is in software. So we'll have, we already see some AI design solutions coming through. The, the idea where we can do a scan and hit print within the scanning software and it will push out to the printer directly or maybe with just one or two clicks. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of progress in that area as well. Materials, some interesting stuff happening with multi-shade printing. Um, and OK, that line's in there twice. Materials, direct printing of aligners, retainers, yes, on digital dentures, um, scan to print. Again, there's a lot of there's a lot in between in terms of design, but we're, we're, we're getting there. OK, let's run into a printing demonstration. So here's a photograph of our sprint ray setup in, in the office here. Sprint ray, formats have a very similar setup as well. Um, and if you're using any other printer, you will have these. I'm going to say three hardware elements and one bit in the middle. But the hardware elements are the printer, the washing unit, the curing unit. The bit in the middle is it's kind of like in a clinic, you've got an instrument tray. That's where you put your dirty instruments. And for printing, we kind of have the same little bit there. It's a tray. It's a plastic tray. It's from a, a filing tray. Um, I just have lots of tissue on that. Model, the, the resin can be there. A little spray bottle of, of IPA. And very importantly, um, we've got our nitrile gloves. And the bin. That wasn't a badly placed um, uh, a photograph, 
I intentionally put the bin there because we're going to be wiping down, cleaning up resin. Resin Printing isn't messy. People are messy. OK, sometimes people think printing is an awful messy solution. Sometimes it is because of the system you have. And um, again, something we like about um, the sprint ray solution. It's easy to be clean, um, but always having a bin to hand is is very convenient. So let's take a quick look into um, preparing oops, preparing the files for printing. Where is my video? OK. You know what? I'm just conscious of time here, uh, running short on time. We've seen the preparation of printing um, for um, uh, for for form labs. Very similar with Sprint Ray. It's cloud based, which is really interesting. You don't have to have a PC connected to the printer. It's cloud based. Um, we can label within it, um, and lots of other bits and pieces as well. Okay, so gloves on. If we have a risk of touching resin, make sure you're wearing gloves. So. Open the lid. I've taken the, the open the cover, taken the lid off the resin tray. Um, always have tissue to hand and a little rubber wiper there as well. So you can see there is some resin in that tray already, but not enough. So I've just taken a bottle, shaken it up, and we're going to add in an extra bit of um, extra bit of resin. You can see there we've got tissue in, in my left hand. It's like like holding a baby, you've always got some got tissue in one hand. And um, so adding in some resin, like pouring a fine wine, then take the tissue on the top and then we just wipe it and get rid of that tissue into the bin, put the lid on the bottle, not a drop spilt. It's all good. Now, if it's a case that the resin has been sitting idle, what you'll find this is across the board on all printers, you'll find that the resin may start separating out. So we've got a little rubber wiper here and we're just going to start mixing things up. And it's kind of like a paint. You know, you let paint settle and the, the colors, the pigments and so on, the chemicals will all start separating. It's the same idea with the resin for 3D printing as well. So we just give that a little bit of a, a mix up. It's OK to leave. Sorry, I'm going to correct myself. With some systems, it's OK to leave the resin in the tray, in the tank, unused. With some other systems, that is not OK. And the recommendation is as soon as you're finished printing or if you're not intending printing within a short period of time, you you got to empty the tray, put it back into put the resin back into the bottle. It cures in ambient light. Doesn't happen with some systems. Um, you can see I just took some IPA and a tissue, just gave a little spray onto the, the rubber wiper and wiped off any excess resin that's there. So we're good to go. Gloves off because the risk of touching of res, the risk of touching resin has gone. So I take my gloves off um, and we interact with the screen. I just called up a file that we've prepared. They'll check there to make sure the build platform is locked in place. The resin tank is ready and that we're, we're good to go. So that machine is starting to take off. Right. But what I'm showing here is if, if you layer, what we're seeing is the image of the layer, the image of the ultraviolet light being projected through. Printers are really exciting, but they're out. it's like watching paint dry. There's nothing to see until the very end when the, the build platform lifts out and we, um, we we see the final object. So when the print is completed, we're going to do we're going to wash the print. So here's just a, again, just an example of the sprint ray solution. So we've got this chamber. That's where the build platform goes. And then on the right hand side, we've got these two other chambers with um, IPA in it. So what happens is chamber one, IPA is pumped in, sprayed apart. Chamber two, IPA pumped in again and sprayed apart. So the build is completed. The build platform is, has finished, gone through all the various cycles. And we can see our two models are sitting there, but the, 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 the re, there's still excess resin dripping away there. So we want to take really good care. Gloves back on again because there's a risk we're going to touch the um, resin. I've got my wiper in one hand. And I'm going to take the take the build platform out. So we just unlock it and remove it. You can see this little action here, kind of just sweep it in underneath, back over the tank. And we can see all that delicious resin that's there. Um, I'm going to use the wiper and to wipe that back into the tank. And so to, I'm doing this for two reasons. Um, number one is I want to save the resin. Okay, I don't want to waste resin. I'm not going to be too uh, pedantic about it. But I just want to remove as much resin as I can from the build platform. However, the more 
important reason is that when it goes into the washing solution, you want as little liquid resin to be there so that when the washing happens, we're not uh, saturating or diluting the IPA too quickly. We want to get as much life out of the IPA as we can. So I'm finished printing for the day. So I'm going to take my black cover. I'm going to put it back over the tank. If I was going to do another print, of course, I can leave that off. Or if I knew I was going to do a print soon, I could leave that cover off. And um, that red plastic covering is sufficient to block out ambient, uh, ambient light. We don't want to position the printer besides direct sunlight uh, by any means. So the washing cycle happens. It's about 13 minutes for that wash cycle. And you can see the, all the IPA is clean away. Just, wa uh, just wiping off any residual IPA that might be there. Again, printing isn't messy. People are messy. Um, so we can wipe them away and I'm just going to pop the two parts off. So a little twist. Sometimes we might use a little kind of spatula type or like, like a paint scraper type device. So the two models are going into the curing unit. Again, gloves off. I'm not touching anything al alcohol or resin based. I select the material, the manufacturer, sprint ray, and I select that it's dye in model two. And then we've got three options either to cure in on the left hand side in the center or the full tray, because we can pa pack that tray full of parts. One minute, 22 seconds. And we'll see now in a second that the, um, we'll see what ha what's happening. So you can see a little carriage of LE LEDs there. High intensity um, ultraviolet light. The parts are being exposed, so that the carriage moves from side side to side. And obviously, if it was, if we were utilizing the whole area of that tray full of models, well then the carriage has to move more, so it's going to take a little bit longer. In this case, there's no temperature, but if we did need a temperature, the um, if we did need heat, should I say, the curing unit would generate that heat, and um, so that and again that the curing will happen at the temperature that it should happen as defined and agreed by the manufacturer of the material and um, of course sprint ray as well that kind of two-party um validation so if you're looking at getting started with 3d printing your digital journey to make your decision try and figure out and identify what you want to do do your research webinars like this there's lots of other resources online as well speak with your peers learn from their successes and learn from their mistakes speak with suppliers um obviously you know we'll you'll find that some suppliers will be a bit more um uh i suppose honest maybe about things that than perhaps others so definitely when i don't say that's not the right thing for to say i'm a supplier <laughs> but you know what i mean it's just make sure you're um maybe just cross-checking everything that you're you you're you're, you're being um told and um, again with your peers if they're using it using the same technologies um do as much research as you can. Understand the key features. Hopefully tonight has helped you identify that and understand some of the key features. Review your requirements because it's a bit of a continuous loop. Your requirements at the start might not be the same as your requirements when you are ready to, to push the button and, and invest in a system. Make a decision. Get printing. Have fun. Enjoy. Enjoy the experience. So I mentioned the design process. Who's going to do the design? If you have dentures, Again, I think in-house dentures, printing of dentures, I think we're, we're just, it's too much, right? Keep your, the thing about printing as well, and sometimes people talk about, okay, is it going to impact the lab and dentist relationship? And it's how you handle it. And I think I think all labs, or most labs recognize that printing is in-house is a real thing. So let's embrace that and see, can we work, can that lab, the scale of a lab and and the needs of a, of a clinic can that still work together? We find now what we're starting to see is some dentists will do a scan, send a scan to the lab. The lab does the design and then the clinician will print in-house. That's one solution. So yes, you could buy software. When people come to us and say, can we buy all the three shape design software, for example, to it's because I want to design a bit of everything. Um, you know, we, we generally say no. And the reason is it's too much of a financial investment, too much of a time investment um, and in terms of learning curve and then the day-to-day -day use of it. And you're not, as a clinician, if you were to design stuff in-house, you're not getting the regular use of the software to become fluid, affluent in it. So definitely outsource it, whether it's to uh, an, a third party, to a local lab, whoever it might be. There's some AI design services out there and some companies offer an online design service where you just pay as a service. So you can use their software to design a crown, for example, and you just pay per click. So rather than investing in software, 
you're utilizing um you're utilizing their services or facilities super the geek scale where are you on the geek scale so we've got i suppose that's starting off this end i want to do it all myself i don't mind i've I don't mind spending two hours in the practice every night after after hours. I don't mind if I get one result one day and I get a different result the next day. And I, it's a problem. I want to sort. I want to sort it. I want to fix it out myself. Just we get turned on and excited about that, and that's okay. There is room for that. Um, but what we find is that most people are down this way. Make my life as easy as possible. If you're looking at bringing printing technology into your practice, you are more than likely looking to delegate that. The, the tasks around that and therefore it needs to be as plug and play as possible so definitely find out where i uh, try and identify where you are in this geek scale um, and where the technology you're looking at getting where it needs you to be um on, on in terms of the geek, the geek scale the learning curve uh, it's a you know we we, we see lots of uh, informat uh, uh illustrations like this um about learning and um, the learning curve we like it to be nice and straight but sometimes it's up and sometimes it's down sometimes it's drawn out um but the bottom line is what you want is for it to be nice and straight and relatively short and that's going to happen when when you got good backup behind you um and that's generally through your supplier through your peers through through various groups that you might be part of i think the one last thing we need to it's, it's kind of like the elephant in the room, this one, MHRA. If you're making anything in-house, anything, in you're making anything in-house, it's going to go in a patient's mouth. It's regarded as a medical device. It's a custom, customized medical device. It's specific to that particular patient. So the registration is a little bit easier. And that's even if you're if you're currently vacuum forming, take printing out of the, out of the equation. If you're vacuum forming on stone models, you're making a retainer, you need to be MHRA um, registered. So it's something that definitely um, it's important. And please, by all means, research it. We've got a, another presentation that we do with, with our customers, just kind of give it a little bit of a, uh, a deeper insight into it. Thankfully, it's not as daunting as, as you might think it is, um, but certainly something that you should be doing. So um, please do your own research, contact MHRA. They've got lots of videos online and, and, and help uh faqs all that kind of good stuff and um you know we're happy to share our experiences and our experiences based on our customers experiences and um, we're certainly not um acting as consultants by any means but at the same time we'd we'll always like to help whenever we can okay so thanks a million for your time if you have any questions um after the webinar i know i'm probably going to get a list of questions from from you very much over time uh, not like me at all um but please there's my email address um phone numbers as well for the office so by all means give me a call um or or or, or drop an email so i've been i've seen some questions coming in um so you can see them popping up there at the bottom um and again just conscious of the time here if um so uh, just to run through a couple of them quickly there. Um, are there any alternatives to cleaning with IPA? Um, not really. There are one or two alternative solutions out there, but the machines, you take something that like that's you know, some other solution and the manufacturer says, this is a great solution that will clean your resin materials, or clean your resin parts. Um, you put that into something like a, a foam wash or, or, or a washing unit provided by another manufacturer. Um, we don't know what's going to happen. Is it going to have any impacts on that and seals and stuff like that? So just be very, very careful. There are some materials out there that are claimed to be water soluble and uh, water cleansable. And um, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about that. I think that human nature is, is IPA. I'm, I can't pour that down the sink. So I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to dispose of it correctly and I'm going to recycle it as much as I can. If it was something that we could take parts out and wash them in, in warm soapy water, well, you're taking something, you're washing it down the sink, and the environmental damage that can be can happen as a result of that could be a lot more, a lot greater than actually working with IPA. So, um, in IPA, it's I'm going to say gold standard. It's across the board for all resin processes. So, or all resin printing, IPA is is the product. So we kind of have to have to live with that. Um, are the materials dangerous? Do they smell? Some resins do smell. Um, and definitely ventilation would be something you need to at least consider, um, even with the IPA as well. Um, a big room, not going to be an issue, um, but something to certainly consider. Um, and some resins from some manufacturers, uh, 
thankfully I don't have any personal experience, but I've heard of some experiences and it, it they can be quite can be quite bad. But for the most part, they don't really smell. Are they dangerous? Um, you know, it's you, you there may be allergic reactions, but if you're running a risk, if you've got a risk of make skin contact with the resin, definitely um gloves on, wear gloves. How much space is required is going to depend on the um on the, the system that you have. For sprint ray, you can see there that that was about a six foot table, uh, six foot, foot countertop. Some of our customers have nice, sturdy and must be sturdy, nice, sturdy shelving units. And you could have the print and the wash. Actually, one was the printer and a, and a computer and then a wash and cure on the, on the shelf underneath. Um, are, are, is it is it possible to print permanent crowns? Um, yes, is the answer. Um, the research, the evidence. Uh, I suppose you're, you're you're currently make resin crowns already. Okay, you make resin crowns with with um, flowable composite. That's a resin. You like yours. Okay, so it's the same kind of materials that are in there. So the same kind of expectations. Um, Sprintray have really nice information about their ceramic crown, which is over in the states, and it's kind of showing in terms of wear resistance and, and fracture resistance, kind of coming somewhere between that kind of Emax, but somewhere between um, a, a milled composite hybrid and and that lithium disilicate. Kind of range as well, so very you know a very usable and something we can be quite confident on, um, in terms of uh, l longevity. And I'm just going to take one more. And what's going to happen is I'm going to get an email. I'm going to get a list of any other questions that are there that I haven't answered. And what I like to do after these webinars is make another little ten minute webinar answering the questions, and then I can mail that out to everybody. So last question is here: Why do people um print hollow models? Um, people print hollow models to ultimately to save resin. Um, to hopefully use less resin. Um, there's a bit of conversation around it, but the, the you you um, yes, you will save a bit of resin. Yes, absolutely, you will. However, it's it's kind of a false economy because by hollowing a model, you're making an internal surface. Internal surfaces like that need extra precautions when you're printing in terms of drain holes. Or you might need to put supports in. If you're putting supports in, well, then you're kind of using resin. In, in another way it can be a lot more difficult to clean um hollow parts as well so it's some, something that we we tend to shy away from the hollowing isn't in a lot of the softwares actually because the manufacturer knows we have hollow parts we have failed prints we have failed prints people associate failed prints with the printer not with the the the, the part being printed if if that makes sense so um and then you get failed prints bad reputation and so on. So really sorry that I've overran. I'm sorry I can't answer all the questions, but I'm really grateful for everybody's time this evening. Um, I hope you've learned something. I hope um, there's been a few little nuggets of information there. Our information is there. Please feel free to reach out at any time. And I look forward to seeing you all on the next webinar. Have a great evening. Thanks a million. Bye-bye.